Hi, welcome to the Sigma Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is actually an instrument I found in the dumpster, and it was in really bad shape. It had lots of stuff all over it. I had to spend a long time cleaning it. So you're seeing the end result here. And this is a 5 gigahertz programmable attenuator. It's almost certainly an electromechanical attenuator, which is nice. And I hope that it would have a very high dynamic range, a very high at maximum attenuation, so that we can use it for receiver sensitivity measurements in the future. It does have a GPIB interface in the back, which is nice, so you can program the attenuation remotely. That's one of the reasons I actually picked it up. And it has a 1 watt maximum input, so that's 30 dBm. That's not surprising. You know, if you have something that attenuates 30, 40, 50 dB or more, all of the power you put in is essentially dissipated in the attenuators themselves. So that's the maximum power you can dissipate, one watt, inside those components. And these are most likely electromechanical. Now it's plugged in already and, yep, absolutely nothing shows up here. I tried, I waited for a while and nothing at all. And this little tiny LCD screen here, which I think just probably shows the attenuation. It's interesting that it has a frequency button. I'm not so sure why it would have a frequency button, maybe just so that you can set the state in which you're measuring something, you know, for perhaps automation or so. Otherwise, for an electromechanical attenuator, this is broadband, so the frequency really doesn't mean anything. It's going to have a certain response no matter what. And I, maybe this keypad is just generic. The connectors are in good shape. So, yeah, let's see what's going on with that. I think we're just going to go directly to opening it because nothing's happening anyway. Oh, and if you're wondering, yes, I did check the fuse. It's not the fuse. It's something else on the inside. So, yeah, that test was already done. And here's the back of the unit. The PCB is facing toward the inside of the instrument, but I can already see two individual electromechanical attenuators here directly connected to the front panel connectors. It's a nice architecture, keeps everything very symmetric and gives you a lot of attenuation because you can just break it up essentially into two units. And it brings the attenuators exactly at the connector in the front panel. It's a nice design. And here's the other side. I started taking these screws off and I just wanted to show you how enclosed this whole thing is. Here are the two attenuators and you can see the connection to the front and this panel over here is really heavy and I think it's because of this screw and I didn't open this one because I think there's a transformer actually connected to it Let's see if I can it's tugging at something it definitely has cables connected to it which side does it go oh it opens this way oh I see okay there you go yeah there you go there's your main transformer and yeah that doesn't look nice so it looks like someone's actually been in here before because there's obviously something missing or maybe these things I have to take a look and see what's going on here because there's a bunch of cables going in and out of this main tr uh, transformer here on the side but it's a very nice design here's a c RF cable connecting the two attenuators let me reposition this so we can examine it a bit more so here you go looking from the other side and I have to say I think we might have gotten a little bit lucky this goes back to the model of don't turn it on take it apart is it may have been a better choice here because these cables, the tips of them are still exposed. And when you close this up, I mean, this is sitting on the bottom of this board. It could be touching the top. So this transformer could have some, most certainly has some voltage on it. And then that could have shorted everything out. And I didn't hear anything or notice anything. And the fuse is still okay. So I don't think anything got shorted. But that was basically lucky. So we have to figure out what used to be here so we can replace it. But in order to do that, we have to take a look at the architecture of the power supply a little bit more carefully. I don't think it's complicated at all. It looks like just a simple transformer linear regulator but there's still something here i mean it could have been a fuse but i don't know why there's four wires anyway let's take a look so looking around here i think this is a mid 90s vintage device and uh, there's a microprocessor 8-bit microprocessor from philips which is 9xp is over there and then we have an uv raisable eprom in here which is probably the main firmware these big chips here are actually rams with uh, built-in ios and timers and some interfaces with the gpib and the back and so on so you know it's really simple all through whole components nothing unusual now this big capacitor here is directly on the two cables that come in so these two cables that are coming into the board go over there and they go right onto this capacitor so that basically pretty much tells us what it needs what's missing here it's definitely a full bridge rectifier so i don't also see one on the board at all which means that they have the full bridge rectifier outside of the main board and I don't know why they would do that because I don't think this is a very high power device. Sometimes they do this because they want to mount it on a heat sink. There's no heat sink in here. They could have used the metal plate the transformer was mounted on as a heat sink. But I think that's what's missing. So either the tra this full bridge rectifier might have died and someone removed it and then they just said, okay, it's not worth fixing anyway. And they might have thrown it away. There were actually two screws missing from the top plate. So that further confirms that someone's been in here. So I think if you put 
a full bridge rectifier here, it should come back to life, but we should examine it a little bit carefully and bring it up slowly to make sure that it doesn't die in the process. It could have been that something else is bad. This capacitor, for example, could be bad. But overall, really simple. Here's the RF connection again between the two, two boards, and these two cables over here control these two electromechanical relays. Other than that, there's really nothing else in here. It's a very simple instrument. Well, this is a perfect opportunity to use my new AC-DC setup for measuring and characterizing power supplies. So I repaired the GW Instec APS-1102 recently, so that directly goes into this iTech module. And this iTech module, of course, connects to the IT9121, which I did a full teardown and review of as well. So the combination of these three things gives me complete control over AC and DC power, including frequency and everything, and very precise power measurement. So it's a really nice setup that I think is going to help us here. Okay, so first thing first, let's figure out what kind of transformer we're dealing with here. So everything is connected. I'm measuring the voltage at the output of the transformer. Nothing's being put into the instrument, and the device is turned off. So let's put something small. Let's say maybe 20 volts. Should be good enough for our purposes. Okay, here's 20 volts. Enable the output. There you go. We see our 20 volt RMS coming in here. There's nothing coming out of the transformer because I haven't turned the device on. And here's the device. There we go. Oh, look at that. 1.6 volts. So 20 coming in, 1.6 coming out. Not bad. So it's a big, big drop. Okay, now we should be able to increase it to its maximum since it seems like it's safe. Okay, here is 120. Okay, here we go. So it's only a 10 volt transformer, actually. 10 volt RMS, of course. 120 coming in, 10 volt going out. Yeah, not bad. Power factor 0.24. That's to be expected. It's purely a, a transformer load on, on top of it. Looking good. So it looks like the transformer is actually working. Um, this seems like a reasonable value. So the next question is now, we, do we put a DC voltage at the input here, or do we just go directly go into a bridge rectifier? I think we can just try a bridge rectifier. So I think I'm going to go ahead and just patch this bridge rectifier capacitor combination, which I made for some other testing, directly into the wires with some jumpers as a temporary solution to see what the power consumption of the circuit is and see if there's anything else wrong besides just missing this piece. Okay, here's our patchwork. So we have the AC directly going into the bridge and then from that to the circuit. And I determine the polarity of this by looking at the capacitor that's on the main board. Now, by the way, I'm doing it this way because we already verified that these voltages are all about 10 volts or 12 volts or so. This is absolutely not recommended if this bridge rectifier was sitting on a DC-DC converter where it was at full potential. Then these voltages would be deadly in that case. This is a very different situation than a DC-DC converter architecture. So please do not do this unless you know that it is a, you're dealing with a similar situation. I've also verified that no high voltage is present on any of these terminals, including uh, the transformer itself is all isolated through this black cable over here. So there's no dangerous voltage anywhere. So be very careful. Okay, so same test. This time we're measuring the DC voltage on the other side. Let's go and enable this. It's 20 volts. There we go. Okay, so when I put in 20 volts, I'm going to get about 1 volt out here. So it's charging the capacitor. Not bad. We're taking 17 milliamps into the rectifier, so it's not a problem. Okay, it's 50 volts. Now we're getting 3.7, 36 milliamp. I think it still looks okay. Oh, I hear clicking. Okay, here we go, 12 volts, and looks good. Yes, I see life. There is actually something on the LCD screen. Turn the device off, the voltage disappears, the current goes on, turn the device back on, <laughs> looking good. So I actually see something on the LCD screen now. That's exciting. So what I think I'll do is I'm gonna go ahead and just remove this bridge rectifier, I have more of these, and I'm gonna mount it with some thermal glue. I found some over here. This one hasn't even been opened yet. So I'm going to take this and mount it directly over here and solder all the cables to it and just close it back up. It's very basic, nothing unusual. And then we should be able to do a test of the actual unit. All right, so everything back together here. At the top, I have the Tektronix TTR500 series, which is a vector network analyzer, USB-based, allows us to have a GUI on the computer and look at things very easily. Port 1 to the input and port 2 to the output, although this is fully bidirectional, of course. Let's give it a try here. Here we go, <laughs> version 1.005, I think, 130 dB. So these instruments typically default to the highest attenuation, so 130 dB is really quite good. I'm happy about that. But now we can now jump to the computer screen and see if we can adjust the attenuation. It looks like I can enter anything I want, let's say zero. There we go, the loud clicking from the mechanical relays, 130, and we can adjust it like that. Okay, let's give it a try. 
here we are. The instrument is already calibrated, and I am plotting S11 and S22 on the Smith chart, S21 and S12 directly on the logarithmic plot. Now the instrument is already set to 130 dB attenuation, so we're basically at the dynamic range limitation of the VNA, so you don't see anything on the S1 and S21. S11 looks pretty good, fairly confined around 50 ohms, which is what you would expect from an att attenuator set to a very high value. But look at S22, this does not look good. I have a feeling there's something wrong, unfortunately. It explains a little bit more of why this was discarded and not repaired. But let's see what happens. I'm going to increase the or reduce the attenuation. Actually, let's start from 0. Here, 0 dB. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> there's definitely something wrong. Look at that. So we have no connection at low frequencies again. This thing is disconnected at low frequencies. It looks like there's a lot of ripple in the band. And it's mid-charged all over the place. Let's increase the attenuation. We can diagnose it a little bit. There you go. Okay, it's, you can see that it's jumping correctly. So it looks like most of the stages of the attenuators are probably fine. Yeah, this is likely what's going on. Let me see if I can put a marker on this. Not quite used to this particular one. There we go. Minus 26 dB. Yeah, 26 dB attenuation. So let me set the attenuation to zero. There you go, at 0 dB attenuation. Wow, there's quite a bit of ripple here, so you're going to see gibberish. Let's put it here at 5 gigahertz. There you go, 2 dB. I'm going to jump by 6, 8. Yeah, there you go. It's jumping by 6 each time. Okay, so it is it is actually doing it correctly. Yeah, but there you go. You can see that's bad. So this tells us a lot, actually. It tells us that the problem is probably on the attenuator connected to the second port of the device, because that's where S22 begins to break down. Now, when you set the attenuation to zero, of course, you see whatever problem on both sides because you're basically creating a through. And you can see the failure on the S11 and S22. But as soon as you increase the attenuation, you can see that the S11 will begin to conf uh, begin, yep, becoming one point. There you go. So that might have been the actual attenuation stage that's failed. And there it is. So, yep, we're going to have to open it back up again. There's definitely something wrong with it. At least we get a, perhaps a more interesting repair out of this. All right, so we're back here. The instrument's been taken apart again, and I can measure the attenuators by themselves. And here's the other one. And actually, unfortunately, both of them have a problem. So in, in some range, some of them show the same issue where there is no low frequency pass. And that's probably because the contacts are bad. It's not just not making a very good connection, and therefore in some settings, you don't get the signal through. So we're going to have to open both of them anyway. But the measurement is really quite simple. We're just measuring the S parameters of this, and I go through all the attenuation settings, and we see the same thing. I think it's worthwhile to take these apart. Even if they're not fixable, we can see the structure of how they're made. So let's make sure all the actuators are actually working. So right now, they're all on the outside position. So by the time I reach the end of the attenuation, they should all be on the inside position. There we go. There's one of them. OK, we keep going. Yep, they're all clicking normally. There you go, they're all on the other side now. So if we go all the way back, we will reach the other end eventually. There you go, so I think that's fine. Remember that there are two of these attenuators and therefore they're switching back and forth uh, in order to achieve the full attenuation every 6 dB step. So that makes sense. And here's inside the attenuator, and everything looks reasonably good. These thin film deposited resistors on a ceramic substrate, which are the individual attenuation stages, they look good. They don't seem to have any cracks on them. And the contacts are a little bit worn out over because of the many striking over many years of this instrument probably being used. And the wipers at the top, the blades look also fine. So these blades either make a contact to this pad or they make a contact to the pad underneath them. Those are essentially moved up and down by the solenoids on the other side. So if you look at the solenoids on this side, I can move one of them artificially down, for example, like this one. If I can get it without damaging anything else. There you go. Once this moves down, those two uh, blades at the top touch the bottom plate now, as opposed to touching the substrate at the top. And when this moves back up to original location, they're pushed up. So there's multiple ways this can fail. Either these do not make contact to the ceramic substrates or do not make contact with the thing at the bottom. And this is essentially always a coaxial line. And if you look carefully on the inside of this, you can see attenuators in between to prevent any reflections and cavity modes to be excited within this structure. So we've seen this before quite a few times. I've taken attenuators apart in the past. So what I'll do is I'll grab some contact cleaner and very carefully brush these areas. You're going to have to be very gentle. You cannot put a lot of it, obviously, because you cannot fill this. Otherwise, the loss of this would be horrible. So it's a very gentle and time-consuming process. But I'll try and see if that helps at all. And if it helps this one, then it will be worthwhile fixing the second one. 
All right, here we go, back again. We're going to try this again. I cleaned the, the attenders for quite some time. Again, as I said before, be careful when you do this. If you cannot just spray, for example, contact cleaner into that, it will totally destroy the attenuator. You have to have a very fine tool and individually clean those tips and then dry them out and remove any residual liquid left in there. Otherwise, the response is going to be quite bad. So I did that. It's kind of a boring, time-consuming job. But now we're going to measure it again to see if that problem has been resolved. And here we are at the S parameters, and you can see the S11 and the S22 look quite a bit already better than what they used to be, and other two parameters are now below the noise of the instrument, so you can't measure anything because we're set to 130 dB attenuation. So let's go ahead and set the attenuator to 0 dB. There we go. Oh, look at that. Very nice. We don't have to drop the low frequencies anymore. It's a nice flat line, and yeah, we got fairly good performance here. So now this original tiny half a dB, you can see the marker here says minus 0.5 or so. That's just from the connectors and the front of the attenuators, whatever is in the way. That's normal. You're never going to get exactly zero, of course. It's just that on top of this, we're going to build attenuation. So here's 3 dB right at the beginning. That's the smallest jump you can make. There we go. Look at that. It's exactly 3 dB. Very good. Now we're going to go 1 dB up at a time. You can see how nice it is. Those little jumps that you see in the response is because the sweep is in the middle of when the attenuator is being switched. This is the dynamic behavior, of course. That's normal. Look at that. 1 dB at a time. Look how beautiful this is. I'm just going to hold the button. And yeah, it's going to continue going and go faster. Let's see. Here we go. Here's 50 dB. Look at that. Beautiful. Continue on. Here's 71 dB. Here's 81 dB. And we're going to get into the noise of the instrument here. You can see the line is not quite, has a lot of variation on it. 92 dB here. And here's 100 dB. Let me just saying roughly 100 dB. So that's beautiful. Well, let's do one experiment with it now that it's working. So at least we can see it do something interesting in the lab. So let's go ahead and use our attenuator here to measure the sensitivity of the Keysight MXR. So the way that's going to work is we're going to get a digitally up converter signal coming out of the M8190 arbitrary waveform generator. That's going to go into the attenuator and out of that is going to go into the channel 1 of the oscilloscope. We're going to use the VSA software to demodulate that signal. We're going to use something reasonable, maybe a 3 gigahertz carrier with a 500 megahertz modulation bandwidth, which is quite a, quite a lot actually. So in that situation, because the M8190 does not have a mechanical itinerary built into it, the lowest amplitude that it is rated for to produce from the direct output is about 300 millivolt. So that's obviously quite large, so it's going to have a very good SNR. But once we put it through the itinerary, we can then make that really, really, really small and see at what point does the key side MXR begin to fail and not be able to maintain the signal-to-noise ratio of the constellation coming from the M8190. So this setup is something quite common when you don't have an itinerary built into something. That's why you would use, for example, something like this mechanical itinerary in the front end. Let's give it a try. And here we are, taking a look at this constellation. Looks very nice. This is a 64 qualm, of course, and we're centered at 3 gigahertz, 500 mega symbols per second. Now, 500 mega symbols per second is quite broad. When it's centered at 3 gigahertz, the oscilloscope has to deal with its own noise across a 500 megahertz bandwidth at a 3 gigahertz carrier, which is a lot. Right now, the total received power is being measured by the oscilloscope at that minus 10 dBm. That's the total amount of power integrated over this band. You can see the EVM is nice and flat across frequency, and we need very little equalization to correct for this channel. So I'm going to keep adding attenuation to it and see what happens. So first, we're going to be 3 dB. There you go, there's 3 dB. You can see that the total power is now minus 13. Nothing really has changed. The SNR is what you want to look at. We're still around 38 dB. So let's keep going. I'm going to increase it from 3 to, let's say, 20. And go, here's 20. Now, as soon as you do this right now, of course, the power is really small and we can, we can see the SNR has degraded. That's because we're still in a very large uh, division on the oscilloscope. So we're going to auto range that. So as soon as we do that, there we go. We go back to normal again. That's because the noise figure of the instrument has been now improved. We are at a 20 dB per division, which I think is a fairly small reference. Let me see if I can find out exactly what that is. We go, so the range is at minus 20 dBm. Okay, good. So let's continue. Here's 30. Now, I don't think auto range is going to make a difference anymore. Let me see. Oh, it might be at the maximum. There we go. Yeah, well, I think it's about the same still. Let's see. No, minus 30. I think this is the smallest. So right now, you can see that the SNR has already degraded. So we're at about minus, uh, at about 31, 32 dB SNR. So we're already beginning to see that the impact of the attenuator, we're basically 
seeing the noise of the oscilloscope more and more. Now we're at a minus 40 dBm total received power, which is really small for such a broadband signal. It's a difficult thing to demodulate. Let's go to 10 dB more. There we go, we're really, really suffering now. I don't think there's anything the auto ranging can do. We're probably at the edge, yeah, there we go. So it's barely able to catch it. The SNR is 22 and a half dB. Yep, it's going to suffer at this point. Let me see if I'm going to enable the low SNR enhancement as well. Not gonna make much of a difference in this case, but there you go, a more stable receiver here. 22 and a half dB SNR. So that signal is minus 50 dBm. That's quite impressive. Now keep in mind, if I make this signal very narrow, you're going to get a much, much better SNR because the noise of the oscilloscope is now being integrated over a 500 megahertz channel here, which is quite a bit bigger than normally you would use at this carrier frequency. So overall, it's really impressive that the MXR can do this. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this repair. I thought it was going to be very simple, but then given the attenuator problem, it takes a long time to refurbish them. But now it's working, so we can put it back in the lab and use it for other purposes. And this little other thing I wanted to show you, I added this to the chassis here because this chassis doesn't have its own LCD screen. So every time you want to use it, you have to take the signal out and connect it to an external monitor. So I just bought one of these tiny little LCD screen has and bolted it into an empty slot here going into two cables with the embedded controller and now this is a touch screen so I can just control it from here and configure it which I thought is quite convenient. As always, I'll see you in the comment section.